Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Just a little bit of background noise too, but. Uh, let me see if I can fix that. Is that better? Yes. Okay. See, I can hear, I can't hear um, when you move things in the background, but um, you probably won't be doing much of that during the, yeah. the presentation, so I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> Okay. Oh. Great. Good. Share my screen. Thanks. I might have to. I just um, I always have to check allow pan panelists to share video. So if uh, it's up to you if you'd like your video to be on or off. Um, yeah. No, I can turn on. I I think I tried. Done, but I wasn't able to. Yeah, just yeah, I <laughs> just updated that. Oh, I always forget to though. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Here we go. Great. And you know, some presenters have been having it on for the intro and then off during the presentation. It's kind of up to you, um, however you prefer. Uh, but again, oh hi, I'm Claire from ECC Minnesota. Um, nice, to you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, I'll be doing the introduction. It'll be really brief. Um, so this is a set up as a Zoom webinar, so people will not be able to unmute themselves, but they I'm going to encourage them to ask questions in the chat. Okay. Um, I've a, are you able to, um, uh, oh, here's a question. Would you like to do questions throughout the presentation or maybe just do questions at the end? Uh, any is fine. I don't really Okay. 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 Um, and, and then will you be able to check the chat box throughout the presentation or would you like some me to, you know, read a read questions out as they come in. Let me just see if I should so right now I just want to make sure I can see it if I share my screen. Yes. Um, so right now my my screen is shared and I'm I'll send you a test. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I do see it. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Okay. That's good. And Great. you can see my PowerPoint, right? Yes, I can see your PowerPoint. Awesome. Um, I do have a couple of um, slides I'd like to show at the beginning, but yeah, sure. let me just double check the screen sharing um, options to make sure that you are able to like take it over from me basically. Oh yeah. So you can, yeah, you see you should be able to take it over from me really easily. Um, yeah. When I am done, so I'm just going to go ahead and share mine and make sure that they look okay. Okay. Yep. So we've got the beginning slide and then just oh, so open up my controls. Oh, okay. And just some information about what's coming up and then got your photo up here. Um, so is this information correct? Cardiology fellow at the University yeah, of Minnesota. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and could you pronounce your name for me? Just to make sure I can. Uh, it's Rahul Singh. Rahul Singh. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so then I will just introduce it again. It'll be pretty short, my introduction. Um, and then I'll just hand it over to you and um, see. Yeah. yeah, we haven't we haven't gotten a lot of questions. Just kind of generally, if people say anything, they say like, "This is great, thanks." Um, so I don't expect that you know you'll have a ton of <laughs> a ton of people asking questions. But um, see, I'll be on the whole time. I will um, mute myself, of course, after uh, the introduction. Uh, do you have any like questions for, for me or anything about the technical side or? Uh, no, I think it should be fine. I don't have any audio. I just have videos that are already embedded in and it's on my computer. So I don't think that should be an issue. Great. Yeah. If there's any, um, if there's any um, uh, technical issues on my side and I don't realize, just feel free to just let me know. Oh, and uh, if okay. there, do you mind uh, just taking down my, my number? Sure. What is your number? Yeah. yeah. Um, let me know whenever you're ready. I am ready. 
Yeah, it's 832-398-3241. So I have 832-398-3241. Yeah. I'll do that. I will let you know. Um, yeah, you. So far, so good. <laughs> so, and uh, is it okay if we record this one? And hey. um, great, wonderful. People do always ask, I know everyone's really busy. We do get a lot of questions about, well, will, there, will there be a recording? I can't make it, so great. So we've got just a couple minutes here. Um, I'll let you know when I'm about to start letting people in right now. Um, we're kind of, we're in that practice session. So if you wanted to grab a glass of water or something, feel free, um, but I'll let you know when we need to get started. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start things off. So I'll probably give it like maybe 10, 20 seconds, 30 seconds to let uh, people kind of filter in and then I will get started. So in about three, two, one. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for joining us for tonight's uh, installment of our FIT lecture series. Um, this is Claire with ACC Minnesota. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know about a couple of upcoming events. Uh, so the Midwest Cardiovascular Forum is coming up in Minneapolis at the end of this month. Um, registration is open and registration rates actually increase uh, starting on Thursday. 
So be sure to sign up if you're planning to attend. Uh, also, our next um, FIT lecture series uh, is coming up, uh, set, talk is coming up on November 8th. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Um, Dr. Rahul Singh is a cardiology fellow at the University of Minnesota. And um, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for being here uh, and listening to me today. I'm not sure how many of you are from the Minnesota area, um, but I will tell you those of you who are from Minneapolis, a warm welcome to you because I have seen that today is probably the last day of good weather until we have eternity of winter. And the fact that you guys are actually listening to me instead of being outside uh, puts a bit more pressure on me to make sure I do a good job and uh, don't make you regret this decision in the future. Um, uh, so with that, I'll get started. Let me just share my screen real quick. And I hope you can see that. Okay. Uh, so today we'll be talking about um, intravas coronary intravascular imaging and physiologic testing. And it'll be a very basic overview, uh, focusing more so on a general cardiology standpoint. This is by no means uh, an interventional cardio uh, fellowship sort of standpoint. I'm myself in the general cardiology fellow. So a little bit very basic, and um, I uh, use a lot of the ACC SAP uh, uh, text to sort of base my talk on to see what they thought was important from a general cardiology standpoint, um, and uh, take it from there. So we'll first start with talking about the intravascular imaging and then go on to the physiologic testing. Um, and the learning objectives are from a coronary intravascular imaging standpoint is basically the uses, the different modalities that we have, and then the differences between those modalities. And from a coronary physiologic testing standpoint, it's to know, uh, know the different modalities. Some of the pivotal trials that have happened uh, to bring this into the forefront and the cutoff values that we use in clinical practice. Um, and then how exactly we use it in clinical practice and then the future directions of uh, this field. So we'll start off with coronary and trivascular imaging. And uh, the first thing is, you know, when do we actually use it? And so before we even do PCI, when we're just looking at the coronaries, uh, uh, the intravascular imaging can help us determine if the left main is significant or not. And we'll talk about this in a bit. And especially if there is stent failure, it can help us determine, you know, the cause of that. Was it instant restenosis or stent thrombosis? Was there dissection and so on and so forth? Um, and then if they're angiographically ambiguous lesions, it can help us uh, decide what to do with them. Sometimes in culprit lesions in ACS as well. And then uh, it can help us determine the risk of uh, distal embolization, especially if there's a really high lipid core um, plaque and then if there's some thrombus as well. Um, now, during PCI, um, it can sort of help us determine if there's a need for lesion preparation. If there's atherectomy required, if, um, you know, we have to do ballooning, uh, when we do ballooning a lot, but even more so. Um, and then uh, if, if we have to cross a CTO, then IBIS is pretty helpful. Um, then if we have to decide exactly where to land the stents and then what kind of stent or balloon to use, that's helpful as well with imaging. And then post PCI, especially after complex PCI, it's helpful to use to see the results and to see if any fi uh, finishing touches are needed or not. And uh, finally, with IVIS, you know, you can uh, repeat IVIS and keep looking at the vessels um, for fine tune uh, imaging, and that can reduce your contrast volume because you don't have to do CINE as much. Interestingly, early in the 1990s, um, intravascular imaging was used quite a bit uh, to look at post PCI uh, results uh, before, you know, sending the patient off. But then in the mid to late 1990s, as the um, uh, uh, balloons and this, uh, the, uh, the stents, the technology changed, we had higher pressure delivery systems at around 16 to 17 atmospheres. And with such high atmospheres, it was thought, it was thought that the, um, that would be adequate to uh, produce uh, proper, appropriate stent apposition. And so IVIS and uh, OCT sort of came down in the US and Europe, uh, while culturally it just continued in Asia. But now, uh, in recent year, in recent years and decades, the um, uh, recurrence of instant uh, restenosis, instant thrombosis, now brought back interest in intravascular imaging as well. Um, now, there are basically two types of intravascular imaging that's used in clinical practice today. That's the IVIS, the intravascular ultrasound, 
and the OCT VAP, the concurrence tomography. Um, and we'll talk about both of these separately, uh, but this is just to let you know, you know what they look like and what the companies, the major companies are. I know here at the U we use a lot of eagle eye, um, but uh, we do use OCT as well. Um, and then within IVIS, there are two main types of IVIS. There is a phased array IVIS and a rotational IVIS, and we'll talk about that. Um, so the rotational IVIS, as uh, the name suggests, is just that there's a, a single uh, transmitter and detector that are mounted on a rotating shaft, um, and then the beam sort of traverses the cross section of the coronary with each rotation of the shaft, and we'll show pictures to make this more clear. Then the solid state is sort of a phased array of stationary transmitter and detectors, and these are oriented circumferentially uh, around the catheter. So this is the solid state on the phased array, and it's this one over here. And as you can see, there are sort of multiple um, uh, transducer elements, and uh, they're you know, located circumferentially around the catheter. They're uh, activated individually uh, in a rotational manner so that it sort of goes around like over here. And um, this is the uh, uh, it's called mechanical or the rotational one, and there's a single uh, transducer element. And this whole thing sort of rotates on itself. And it looks like that. And this whole thing sort of rotates around. Um, and uh, while you're basically, you go from the distal end to the proximal end of the vessel. And this can be done either manually with the, um, with the um, interventionist pulling it back, or it can be done uh, from motorized pullback. Well, uh, in my limited experience, what I've seen is usually it's a manual pullback. And my guess is because it's more tedious to sort of attach it to the motorized pullback and then turn it on and stuff. So usually I've just seen them do a manual pullback with uh, IVIS. Um, then this is just how the, um, this is the, um, uh, so the, uh, the solid state ones. And these are the ones that I've seen use the Eagle Eye one, these different um, uh, versions of it that are available. And uh, I couldn't get any better picture of the rotational, but this is what the rotational IVIS looks like. Um, then just the differences between these two. So the phased array one, uh, you do not need flushing for it. And for the rotational one, you do. Um, for the, the phased array though, it does give you color Doppler, but at the same time, it is harder uh, to cross severe lesions, whereas the rotational one, it's easier to cross. Uh, uh, the rotational also has a higher resolution, uh, but for CTO crossing, the phased array is preferred because the imaging that it does is closer to the tip, so you can see right at the edge of the uh, CTO. Uh, I'll let you know that again. This is not something that is required uh, that you're required to know from a general cardiology standpoint, but this is just out of interest. Um, and then this is just a, a quick case. So over here, I know you can see disease in the stroke, but I just want to focus on the left main, and uh, the left main sort of does look pretty tight over there. And so if uh, the I IVIS was done on this lesion, and um, so you can see the, uh, the lesion on, on that, but more importantly, the cross-sectional area, when you see that that's calculated 5.6, and we kind of talk about these cutoffs, but basically you can, uh, that, that's deemed to be significant, and then you have to know that you have to intervene. So this is an example of uh, determining left main significance using IVIS. Um, now, just a few other, you know, pictures of what IVIS looks like. So this is stent malapposition. So here is the actual stent, uh, but you can see that blood is actually going all around and you can basically means that the stent is not really pushed against the vessel wall appropriately. And here you can see as well, this is a stent and there's blood still, uh, you know, going around the stent. So it's not pushed against the, the um, vessel wall. You probably have to dilate it more. Um, another thing just to let you know that, again, from a general, stand, general cardiology standpoint, this is not, uh, identifying these things is not something that you have to know. This is just letting you, showing you know what all this looks like. Um, and then this is a dissection. And over here, you can see the, you know, blood going through into the, um, the vessel wall. And over here as well, you can clearly see that. Um, and then this is what an intramural hematoma will look like. This is on the angio, you can see it over here. And then over here, you can see it easily on the intravascular ultrasound images. Uh, so just talking about the left main, again, this is not, um, uh, this is just out of interest, um, but the uh, left main PCI sort of came back into, you know, the limelight after these three trials. You don't have to know these trials, but just very, very briefly going through them. The syntax was the synergy between uh, PCI and uh, with taxes and cardiac surgery. 
Um, and basically, it was looking at PCI versus uh, using the taxis uh, stent versus uh, cabbage for three vessel or left lean disease. And although the primary uh, endpoint of MACE uh, was um, higher in the PCI group, that was driven mainly by uh, the need for revascularization. The uh, incidence of uh, stro uh, death and MI were actually the same in both groups, cabbage and PCI. And uh, the cabbage group actually had more strokes. Um, so that brought you know, the, the possibility that the left main PCI is not a bad idea. Then you had two trials, the Excel and the Noble trials. The Excel was the um, uh, evaluation of the, the um, uh, Exeus uh, uh, stent versus cabbage um, for left main revascularization. And Noble was the Nordic uh, Baltic British left main revascularization effective, effectiveness trial. Uh, something along those lines. Uh, but both of these trials were looking at left main versus cabbage, uh, sorry, uh, PCI versus cabbage for left main disease. And uh, the Excel trial was the larger trial with 1,900 patients, and the Noble trial was the smaller trial, that had like around uh, 1,500, 1,200 patients. Um, the Excel trial showed that there was no difference in primary outcomes in MACE, uh, even at five years between PCI and cabbage, whereas the Noble trial actually was showed that there was a significant difference and that PCI was inferior, was, was inferior to cabbage uh, for left main intervention. But all of these trials it seemed like it was like murky results if you take all of them together. But regardless of that, it did bring about an interest in left main PCI. And then, you know, uh, intravascular ultrasound was sort of brought back in uh, for, for determining the significance of these. And so you don't have to know these cutoffs, uh, but uh, the minimal lumen diameter, the diameter of basically 2.8 is the cutoff and the area of less than six millimeters squared is the cutoff for the left main. And uh, if it's greater than 7.5, that means that the left, like uh, it can be safely deferred if there's a lesion in the left main. And between six and 7.5, then that's sort of a gray area. And then you probably have to do IFR, FFR, some physiologic assessment to determine uh, to intervene or not. And then, Going on to the next uh, uh, modality, OCT, optical currents tomography. This basically uses um, infrared light. And this light, unfortunately, is absorbed by erythrocytes and RBCs. So basically, in order to do this, you have to create a blood-free environment. And usually, that's done by um, giving a contrast. In the older um, devices, you actually have to occlude the artery with a low-pressure balloon, and then they give a flush solution. Uh, whereas in the current systems, they have uh, faster acquisition times. So you can use uh, the simultaneous injection of contrast. Um, you can also use saline, but I've mainly seen contrast use. Um, and it's used at four meters per second. And uh, you can do acquisition at the same time uh, since it does it so fast. Uh, but basically, the thought process is that you have to displace the blood um, so that the, um, there's a completely blood-free uh, environment because if that doesn't happen, then they would have blood artifact, and that blood artifact can mimic thrombus or dissection and give you a false um, uh, lead. Um, the higher viscosity solutions, they do displace blood better, uh, but the trade-off is that you need higher injection pressures, and that sort of increases your chances of you know, coronary uh, dissection or uh, perforation. Uh, Nitroglycerin can be given for dilation if there's any significant lesions that you're worried about, but they do not, uh, nitroglycerin does not have to be given a routine necessarily. And so just looking at this uh, case, so over here you can see the LAD and there seems to be some lesion in the mid LAD. Um, and so this is the OCT of that lesion and uh, we'll be able to see the thrombus. But the image on the right is more important because you can see the cut section of it. So the sort of key th acute thrombus causing ACS in this patient. And so uh, when it comes to OCT, this is just you know, um, what you actually see. There are two main things uh, that uh, parameters, uh, the backscatter and the attenuation. The backscatter is how bright something looks on OCT, and then the attenuation is uh, how well it um, absorbs, how well light passes through it, and if light completely goes through it or not. So if you have fibrous tissue or fibrous material like an A, uh, that has a high backscatter, so you can see it's very bright, uh, but low attenuation, meaning that light is able to pass through very easily, and you can see the structures behind it as well. 
And this is just a histologic cross section of the same vessel showing you what the vessel actually looks like. So you can appreciate the correlation between the image of the vessel and the OCT image. Um, now, when you have calcium or calcified lesions, calcium uh, also uh, calcium has a low backscatter, which means that it appears dark, but it has a low attenuation as well, which means that light travels through it pretty well in, in OCT. Um, and uh, that's one of the perks of OCT actually being able to visualize calcium really well. And uh, here you can see the well-defined calcium that you can see over here. It's a really good um, definition of the calcium. And then if you have a lipid-rich uh, plaque, then that uh, has a low backscatter as well, similar to calcium, meaning that's dark, but it has a high attenuation, meaning that light does not pass through it really well, and that's why you can't really see the edges uh, beyond that lipid area too well. And you can see that's the cross section over there. Um, and then um, these are just other uh, images just for you to appreciate what we are able to see with uh, OCT. So uh, this is just an, an erosion that's present. And you can, this is the, so these are the images that you'll be seeing when you're doing the actual cath and, you know, the attendees doing a pullback. And these are the reconstructed images that the device creates for you to see the whole, um, uh, vessel uh, in a linear manner, in a longitudinal manner. Um, and so over here, uh, you have an erosion and you can easily see the erosion between B and C occurring over there. And over here, you can see it right over here. Um, and that's a re re uh, constructed images. And while you're doing the OCT, you'll be able to see these things over here. This asterisk over here is just to show what uh, branch vessels is probably tagged, you know, probably B2. Uh, coming off, um, and you can see that over here. So that's how a branch like a diagonal would look like when you do OCT. And then uh, the second image is a rupture, and you can see the rupture happening around G and F. Um, and over here as well, you can see between G and F this rupture very beautifully over here. And while you're actually doing the OCT, you'll be seeing it like this, and you can see the rupture uh, uh, pretty evident over here. And then uh, finally, the third image is an eruptive calcific nodule. Um, and over here, you can see that right between G and K over here. Uh, and you can see beautifully over here as well um, in the cross section images. So, really, like if you go through, like if you see these images, they look, they look pretty detailed and um, you can really see what's happening in the vessel. Um, post PCI, this is a busy thing, but what I just want to uh, point out was post PCI, the um, OCT can help you see that if there's any dissection happening. Uh, near the uh, stent edges, um, how much of the, if there's any tissue protrusion happening in the stents, sorry, let me go back, one second. Um, or um, if there's any malposition, the stent's not just uh, properly against the wall. Uh, so it can really start make you decide if the, on uh, an geography, you know, it might, it might, everything might look okay, but the OCT will really give you the finer detail of everything's really okay if you have to still do some fine touches to your uh, PCI. And just to give an example, so this is an RCA that was stented. Um, and initially, it, the, on the naked eye, at least, it looks all right. But then when you look, look at the iris, um, let me play from the beginning, you can see that there's some, um, that's a stent over there. And then there's still some thrombus, and that's the dissection flap right there. And there's still some thrombus there. Uh, let me play that once more. So once again, over here, that's a stent, and then that is a thrombus, that's a dissection flap over there. And so this obviously needs more ballooning and more stenting for a, 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 a more perfect result. And the OCT is able to give you uh, those details. Um, now, when it comes to calcium, as I mentioned, that the OCT is actually uh, one of its strengths is being able to visualize calcium. And um, this, uh, there's a calcium score that they have, uh, they've made. Uh, this is more so used for research purposes and academic purposes, uh, but I believe in, I, I think, and I feel that in the clinical setting, the attendings sort of just know um, these uh, cutoffs and you can, you can just, they, you know, you can see the calcium and see if it's high risk or low risk. And uh, what they're looking at is, again, this, this scoring system is not important from a general board standpoint, but just out of interest, um, you can see the maximum, maximum calcium angle. That's this over here. And just to see how much of the vessel the calcium really encompasses. And if it's greater than 180, that's two points. That's 180 and zero points. Um, the thickness of that calcium, and that's just measured in that same cross-sectional view. 
And then the calcium length, and that's mentioned, that's uh, measured in the uh, longitudinal reconstructed group. And then you get a score of 0 0.4.6. And the reason this is important because it can affect your outcomes post PCI. And just to give an example, so the first case over here, this calcium score based on these parameters is the calcium score of two. PCI was done and the stent, uh, the lumen area versus stent area, so the expansion was 99%. So that's a pretty good result. Um, then you look at the second case, based on those parameters, the calcium score is one, so pretty low, uh, low score. And uh, the expansion of the stent was 97%. So again, a pretty good result. But then you see this the last case over here, and the calcium score is four points, and the expansion is only 68%. And that's because obviously the calcium it will be hindering the uh, balloon trying to expand and place a stent over there. And so based, based on this scoring system, you can sort of decide which lesions have to be uh, um, treated beforehand with uh, atherectomy or um, renovation or whatever technique you want to use, but uh, it helps determine the, the pretreatment before doing the PCI. Um, then we've talked about IVUS and OCT. Now, obviously, the, the question would be what's the difference between OCT and IVUS and when to use which one? Uh, to be very honest, this is a more nuanced conversation, which is not really in the scope for a general fellow, but it's probably more for the scope for an interventional fellow and interventional attendings. But just to give you a very basic idea, um, because you are going to be seeing these things in the cath lab regardless whenever you rotate through the cath lab. So it's good to know at least the basics. Um, so just the differences, we already talked about IVS being ultrasound, OCT is infrared. Uh, the resolution is um, in micrometers is obviously higher in the OCT compared to the IVIS. Uh, the frame rate is also higher. Um, however, uh, OCT does require blood uh, clearing, otherwise you get artifacts. IVIS does not require that. So you do have to give contrast while you're acquiring OCT images. Um, at the same time, the, although there is higher uh, resolution for OCT, the penetration is not that much. So you can't see things up far beyond, whereas IVIS you can. Um, but then the uh, advantage of OCT is that you can see um, uh, through calcium and calcium is really well defined. Uh, so it really helps you decide on uh, pretreatment or any lesion modification is needed prior to stenting, which IVIS will have some difficulty. Um, and then uh, this slide is again, just a busy slide, but just the differences between the two um, contrast admission is required for OCT. The image resolution is better. Tissue penetration is slightly uh, less compared to uh, IVIS when it comes to OCT. Um, and then image interpretation is easier. As you saw, the images of OCT really clear of exactly what's happening. Um, and then thrombus and calcium can be seen better with OCT, uh, but then, uh, and stents as well. Uh, and then platinum morphology as well. And just to uh, drive this concept home, so this is, both of these vessels have calcium in them. Uh, the calcium is over here, and this is an IVIS of that same vessel. And you can see you can't really have, you, you might be seeing some dark areas, but you don't, you can't really definitively see what it is. Whereas in this vessel, you see the calcium here, and you can do OCT, and you can definitely see that that is calcium. And so uh, that's why for uh, calcific lesions, uh, you concerns OCT would be the winner over there. Um, and then uh, just coming to this case, there you can see something um, happening in the LAD. And uh, the same case, and then you do an IVIS on it, and you can see there's something happening in the three o'clock area, but you're not too sure exactly um, what it is. And when you put color Doppler through it, then as well, you can see some blood going through it, but you're not sure what exactly it is. Uh, or it doesn't seem that clear. And then when you do um, IVIS of it, then you can sort of really clearly see this dissection and you can uh, really appreciate it uh, on the IVIS, which wasn't really possible that much on the OCT. Um, so that was just to sort of tell you the differences between the two. And that was all that I had for the um, intravascular imaging standpoint. And uh, we will now uh, move on to Corey physiologic testing. Um, and by the way, before I move on to this, I should have uh, started off by saying this, but I forgot that um, if you guys do have any questions, uh, feel free to ask at any time. We do have the chat box function. Uh, if you want to ask questions at the end, that's completely fine as well. Um, and similar to the coronary, uh, the intravascular imaging part, the coronary physiologic testing, I've tried to make it 
um, very basic for a general cardiology standpoint, and uh, not go into the nitty gritty details of uh, all of these things. That's that's probably more appropriate for an interventional fellow or attendant standpoint. Um, so the first uh, modality of coronary physiologic testing that was that had come about was um, coronary flow reserve, and this is basically the resting coronary flow velocity to the hyperemic flow velocity. Uh, it sounds very similar to the FFR that we're used to, but uh, this actually measured the entire coronary circulation. So the epicardial and the microvasculature. Um, and it basically was looking at the capacity of the coronary circulation to respond to a physiological increase in oxygen demands with a corresponding increase in blood flow. Uh, the, just to drive this point home is that this is the uh, epicardial vessels that we're used to seeing in, in the cath lab. These are vessels that we act upon, like we have the PCI. We often sometimes don't even go into these small branches over here. We stick to the big branches in the main vessels. And this is the actual microvasculature of the heart. And you can see the stark difference. And sort of, this sort of gave me the appreciation of how extensive uh, the microvasculature was and is, and you know how much of an effect that then, then has to ischemia. And these are, all of this is stuff that right now we can't really intervene on uh, apart from giving, you know, trying medical therapy. There's nothing much we can do for all of these vessels. The only things we're acting upon are these vessels. Um, and so it's obvious that, you know, the, um, the, if there's, even if the, if the large vessels, the epicardial vessels are fine, there's something wrong with microvasculature, the patient would obviously still be having significant symptoms. Um, and so CFR, I've actually never seen this used at all, and it's gone out of practice. And the main reason is uh, because uh, it doesn't really differentiate between the epicardial and the microvasculature uh, of the heart. So uh, it, I mean, it'll tell you if the flow is low, but you don't know what, what's low, what it's low because and what you can do about it. So at the same time, also, it, it's very fragile in its results. So even slight disturbances like tachycardia, stress, misoactive drugs, et cetera, it can throw it off and then give you an abnormal result uh, that's falsely abnormal. Uh, the other thing is that the cutoff for CFR, I know that there have been cutoffs of two, some people said 2.5, uh, but there's another school of thought and then new studies showing that three to four might be normal. And the... Um, there's no really true cutoff, and the thought and the the argument is that the some people argue that the initial cutoff uh, uh, was based off of um, uh, the CFR that was done in patients who were in the cath lab for um, for an angiogram to begin with, and so if they were already in the cath lab and referred by a cardiologist, it means that they probably had some amount of heart disease, and so their CFR would not be normal to begin with, and so we can't use their CFRs to make a normal. And that's what was used in initial studies. So really there's a, a normal value you're not too sure about. Um, and then obviously uh, the CFR is measured using Doppler velocity wires. And so there, there are lots of challenges apparently with it. I've not seen it being used, so I can't really comment on that, but that's uh, one of the reasons it sort of went out of practice. And obviously the clinical implications were really lacking at that point. So um, then uh, we have this, and so I talk about this concept. Um, so when we have um, max, a maximal hyperemia, uh, this is just a normal vessel, and this is a vessel with stenosis. So the, the head pressure over here, so this is a proximal vessel, this is a distal vessel, that's the microvasculature, and that's the venous side. But the, uh, the head pressure, let's say it's 100, and there's a stenosis here, and the pressure drops to 70, and there's a delta 30 because of the stenosis. Now, in maximal hyperemia, the beauty of it is that the coronary perfusion pressure is uh, linearly related to the flow. So if there is a drop of 30% of the perfusion pressure, then there's a 30% drop in the flow as well. And so using this concept um, in, again, this is in the setting of maximal hyperemia. Using this concept, that's what brought about the use of the FFR, the fractional flow reserve. And so this is basically the maximum myocardial blood flow in the presence of an epicardial stenosis to the maximum flow in the hypothetical absence of the stenosis. And usually that, the second part is derived from the proximal uh, part of the vessel before the stenosis. And so 
the maximal hyperemia eliminates the effects of resting hemodynamics. Um, now, in terms of FFR cutoffs, initially, actually, an FFR cutoff of 0 0.75 was used because this was 100% specific for inducible ischemia, and this was used by pigeons uh, when they came up with it um, using non-invasive stress testing like uh, stress echo, stress EKG, and stuff like that. They used those tests to come up with this 0.75 value, and the first trial was done using this, uh, the first clinical trial. But after that, people said that, you know, the point, uh, point 0.80 is uh, more sensitive for the absence of ischemia. And then the subsequent trials started using this as a cutoff. And this is the cutoff that we use currently in clinical practice as well. The 0.75 uh, is not used anymore. Um, and so how is it derived? Um, the, so you have the myocardial flow uh, in its post stenosis, after the stenosis, and the myocardial flow in the normal vessel, which is basically before the stenosis. And flow is basically a change in pressure, delta pressure over resistance. And so when you plug in this uh, into these uh, flows, basically the resistance cancels out and then the venous pressure cancels out. And all you're left with is the PD over PA, which is the distal, uh, distal pressure over the proximal uh, pressure. And this is again, this is at maximal hyperemia because that is where uh, it's uh, linear. Uh, the relationship between the pressure and the flow is linear. Um, and so just to show the difference uh, between um, FFR and um, the CFR, coronary flow reserve, FFR is basically only going to be testing the um, epicardial vessels. That's the lesion, it's going to, the, wire, the wire is going to go up to here, and then you're going to do a pullback, and that, that's all that you're going to test. It. The CFR is going to be testing both the epicardial and the microvasculature, both. And then it's not able to differentiate between which, which area is actually affected. And the IMR, the index of microcircuitry resistance, that's sort of something new that's coming up that we we'll just very, very briefly touch on at the end, but uh, that's basically just testing the microvasculature itself and independent of the, um, of the um, epicardial vessels. Um, and then the common base dilators used, I'm not gonna go through all this, uh, but basically adenosine is the common ones. You can give it as an IV infusion, an intracoronary bolus, or an intracoronary infusion. Um, the uh, side effects are obviously, you know, having shortness of breath or chest pain. Um, you can also have transient heart block, uh, and it can be, uh, the, especially the intracoronary infusion can be difficult to set up. Um, Regadenosin can be used, but it is uh, convenient, uh, but it's also expensive. Uh, I've not seen any of these other type of and nitroprusside. I mean, we use it for other reasons, but it is an expensive, um, but obviously can cause hypertension. And then dobutamine, um, it can take time to actually take effect. And uh, Nicorandil, I've not seen that used. And I guess that's because it's not available in the US. Um, and so this is what uh, the FFR would look like and what you'd be seeing in the cath lab on the monitor. So over here, uh, we have a lesion over here. The wire lead passed, uh, you, you, you first zero it to the proximal vessel, see what the baseline is, and you pass it down the vessel and the lesion, and then you pull it back up. And then, um, uh, sorry, give hyperemia as well, uh, like the adenosine. So at rest, uh, the red and the green are basically, the red is the uh, proximal um, part of the vessel, and the green is the distant part of the vessel. So once hyperemia is induced, you can see that both of them drop um, simultaneously. There's no vasodilation, so the pressure will drop. And the pressure seems to be dropping, um, uh, uh, both the proximal and distal pressure seems to be dropping uh, together. And so you can see that the FFR between of the 9782 is 0.85, which signifies that it's, it is not significant. So that is, when you just look at that region, it might look significant, but uh, hemodynamically, it's actually not significant. And then you don't really have to act on it then. And then over here, um, again, FFR was done of this um, uh, lesion. And you can see this over here that, that you could argue maybe you know, it doesn't look that significant. But again, over here, when they did FFR, you can see in hyperemia that the proximal one doesn't actually drop that much, uh, but the distal one does. And then you have a, a positive FFR, a significant FFR of 0.68. And then you know that you, have, you should intervene on that lesion over there. Um, now we'll come to a few trials um, regarding FFR. Um, and what I want you to know is that I'll be going into details of these trials, but obviously you do not have to know all these details. 
But just knowing the names of these trials is helpful just because, just because these are sort of the pivotal trials in this uh, field and FFR is sort of used ubiquitously in the, in the cath lab at this point. So the first trial was the uh, deferred trial. And basically they were looking at fractional floor reserve to determine the appropriateness of angioplasty in uh, moderate corneal artery stenosis. Um, and so they basically, this was published in June 2001 in CERC, and um, they basically looked at patients who were referred for um, elective uh, PCI. And they had uh, non-invasive testing done before that showed no ischemia. And uh, they uh, randomized the patients to the treatment arm uh, or the deferral arm. And in both arms, the patients underwent PCI and they went, uh, underwent FFR. Sorry, they underwent coronary angiogram and they went, uh, underwent FFR. If the FFR was less than 0.75, remember this was the initial cutoff that Kudelza had initially come up with um, based on uh, 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 correlating FFR to non-invasive testing. So if the FFR was less than 0.75, regardless of which group the patient was in, they got PCI done because that was deemed to be a pretty significant lesion. And they were plugged into this different group called the reference group. Whereas if their FFR was more than 0 0.75 and they were in the deferred group, they had nothing done. No PCI was done, no balloon angioplasty, no. And if they were in the PCI group and their FFR was more than 0 0.75, then they had a PCI done. And so the results of this study, so we want to see the blue is the deferred group, the patients with FFR greater than 0 0.75 and no stents placed, versus the red group, which is the performed group, that's FFR greater than 0 0.75 and stent perfects. And if you see, there's actually no uh, real difference uh, in outcomes between these two groups. Um, the for reference group, uh, I won't be comparing them too much because they were less than 0.75 to begin with, and all of them got PCI done. Um, and then uh, this is uh, patients that were free of angina. And if you see, again, the blue is the patients who did not get stents placed, and the red were the patients who were got stents placed. So uh, at 24 months, there's actually a significant difference between the two. And the patients who did not get stents placed actually seem to have less angina compared to those that did for FFR zero than 0.75. So uh, this study sort of, sort of showed that you know you could defer doing PCI if the FR was greater than 0.75. But they want to take this a step further. And so we have the next tri big trial, that's the FAME trial. Um, that was basically FFR versus angiography for guiding PCI. And they wanted to see if uh, we could use FFR instead of just you know, uh, relying on the eyes of an interventionist, if uh, you could use FFR to guide decision-making completely uh, during, a, during an interventional case, rather than just using FFR greater than 0.75 to defer PCI. And so um, they basically uh, took patients who had lesions determined to be more than 50%, at least two or three uh, vessels, like the LD, CERC, and LCN. Um, and then uh, they were randomized uh, to either the angiography guided PCI, so just looking at the vessel, uh, with, your bear, with you know, just your eyes and deciding if the patient requires PCI or using FFR uh, to guide the PCI. And then their cutoff now following the FAME, this FAME trial is where the cutoff was uh, put to 0.8. And moving forward, it became 0.8 up until like today in clinical practice as well. It's that same 0.80. Um, and then they had one year follow up. Um, and so just looking at this, um, the events at one year MACE was basically not significant between the FFR and the angiography group. And even looking at the subsets of death, MI, uh, repeat uh, vascularization, uh, and, total, and uh, none of that was actually significantly different between the angiography and the FFR group. Um, and then uh, this is again just um, uh, the uh, uh, the death by MI actually, sorry, it was less than the um, FFR group, I apologize, I overlooked that. Um, and this is just a graphical representation. So death and MI were, were 0 0.04, so it's going to 35% less, and then MACE was 30% less because of that. Uh, uh, then, interestingly, you know, one of the, at that point, one of the concerns was that, you know, if you do FFR, you're going to increase the cost, it's going to take longer and all this stuff, but uh, you're going to use more contrast, uh, but interestingly, the amount of contrast used for the FFR group was actually lower. That statistically significant. 
um, the number of stents placed as well was lower, and that's obviously because you probably were placing stents in this group when patients who didn't require stents to begin with. And then the cost was actually lower in the FBAR group as well. I did not look at the breakdown, but my guess is we're probably placing less stents and that might have driven down the cost. Um, so this sort of showed that, you know, FFR can really be used um, to guide PCI and uh, really help put uh, FFR into uh, mainstream. The one criticism that people had about this trial was that they did not have a medical therapy on. So the argument was that if a patient has stable CAD, and even if the FFR is greater than 0.8, you, sorry, less than 0.8, and you're telling me that it's, it's, it's a significant lesion um, based, on your, based on your calculations, does, is there a change in outcomes for patients versus if I just give them medical therapy? And so to answer that question, we had the FAME2 trial. And this was basically uh, the FFR-guided PCI versus medical therapy and stable coronary disease. And so well, they had basically 800, around 800, 900 patients, and it was equally divided between patients who had um, known coronary artery disease. They had one group basically got PCI that was guided by FFR done, followed by optical medical therapy. And another group had no PCI done, and they were just treated medically. And this is for stable coronary artery disease. Um, and so the results for this trial um, were that if you see the primary endpoint, medical therapy would get much worse. Um, and this was statistically significant. And this trial actually had to be terminated early uh, because of these results. But if you look at the breakdown, interestingly, it's um, not the death from any cause and not the MI, but it's the urgent revascularization that actually drives this difference between the medical therapy and the FFR-guided PCI group. Um, uh, but I mean, this, this trial really showed that, you know, uh, using FFR guided PCI is for stable coronary artery disease is superior to medical therapy, um, at least for urgent revascularization and preventing that. Now, the, um, the uh, qualms that people had with this trial was that there was no blinding done of the investigators or the patients. So that was one thing. Um, and uh, the five-year follow-up, this is just a firm once, but they did do a five-year follow-up and the results were still similar. So this, uh, the, these three trials sort of really put um, FFR on the table. And then there were further many more trials that we won't be talking, studies that we won't be talking about uh, that sort of looked at FFR for different lesions uh, and patient populations and sort of, you know, for intermediate left main disease, for serial lesions, for bifurcations, for diffuse disease, for ACS, non culprit vessels in STEMI and culprit vessels after remote MI and all this stuff. Um, so it sort of really blew up after these, uh, the, the defer, the FAME 1, and the FAME 2 trials. And the good thing about the FFR is that the normal, the normal value of 1.0, and you can get that in every patient vessel if it's normal. Um, there's a well defined threshold of 0 0.80. There's no question about it at this point in clinical practice. Um, and it is specific to the epicardial vessel, so it does not, it does not get uh, affected by the microvasculature. Uh, so it's only showing you the vessel that you can act upon. Um, then it does account for collateral flow. Uh, it is independent of hemodynamic changes. It's not as finicky as the coronary flow reserve. Um, there's excellent reproducibility, um, and it is um, validated against the two non-invasive reference standards. That was the initial studies that were done by uh, Fizzle. And then um, it is extremely validated against clinical outcomes in a variety of patient populations and lesion subsets. Um, so I've told you all these great things about FFR, but the reality is, is that it's actually not used as much in the cath lab. Um, and some of the drawbacks of the FFR is that there is a prolongation of procedural time. Um, there's additional cost for the wire and adenosine. And then there's side effect from adenosine. Patients can feel chest pain, can feel shortness of breath. And then there's suboptimal mechanical quality of the pressure wires is difficult to manipulate sometimes in complex anatomy, uh, leading to procedural complications possibly. Um, and the reason all of these sort of came into picture was because um, people came up with non-hyperemic pressure ratios. So FFR, you have to use something to cause hyperemia, and that's likely adenosine. But when FFR became famous, then people started looking at, and even before people were trying to look at ways to do the same thing, look at the same thing without giving any basic diagnosis. Um, and so one of, the, one of the first ones was the IFR. 
that's the instantaneous wave-free ratio. And so for these, uh, for this, you do not have to use any kind of basic dilator. You just have to put a pressure wire uh, across the region, um, and that's it. So that just looks at the distal pressure to the proximal pressure during a specific time frame in diastole, when the myocardial resistance is presumed to be at its lowest level and it won't interfere with um, the the, uh, the data that you're getting. So, <coughs> sorry. During this phase, uh, the proximal distal pressures are proportional to coronary flow, and they have an initial cutoff value, of, uh, the value of 0.90 to 0.89, um, and that was deemed to have an overall diagnostic accuracy of 80% to predict an FFR of 0 0.80. So basically, IFR of less than 0 0.90, less than equal to 0.89, is 80% accuracy to an FFR of less than 0.80. So where exactly does this happen? Yeah, this is a very busy uh, graph where you don't have to go through it in detail, but basically what I want to uh, stress on is that these are just the waveforms the wave uh, happening uh, during the cardiac cycle um, during, from the microcircuitry and the proximal originating uh, vessels. But this wave-free period, this green bar over here, there you can see that it is uh, pretty quiet. Um, and uh, the the reason that's important is because then you see the red line and the blue line, the pressure and the velocity, they actually become linear during this phase, um, similar to when we induce you know, um, uh, maximal hyperemia. And so this, uh, again, during the cardiac cycle, this phase of diastole, it's um, basically the, uh, uh, it ends at five milliseconds before the end of diastole, and it begins 25% uh, into diastole. 25% into diastole, Five milliseconds before diastole ends, that's the wave free period. And usually you take around five beat average of the pressures, the proximal and distal pressure to get the PDP one. Um, and so for this IFR, um, there were two main trials done. The first one was the IFR sweetheart. Um, and this was the this was funded by the volcano arm of Phillips. They own, they have, a, they made the, uh, they made the IFR, they made the pressure wire, they have the provider over the whole, um, the uh, theory and the, the practicality of it. Um, so in this study, basically, they looked at the Swedish coronary angiography and angioplasty registry. Um, and they took around uh, 2,000 patients. Um, they were stable angina, unstable angina, and STEMI patients. And they were assigned to the IFR group or the FFR group. And they underwent PCI with the FFR cutoff being 0.8 and the IFR being uh, 0.8. And when you look at the outcomes uh, for primary endpoint of means, um, there's actually between the IFR and FFR group, there's actually no statistically significant out, uh, difference. And even if you go through each one separately, you see that there's actually no significant difference between the death from any cause, non fatal MI, unplanned revascularization, uh, restenosis, et cetera. The only difference was actually chest discomfort during the procedure, and that was, as expected, higher um, um, in the FFR group, uh, mainly because of the use of adenosine and that causes patient's chest discomfort, and you're avoiding that uh, with IFR. Um, and then this was done, and this is just a captain mark of the same uh, results to show that there's no significant difference between the two. So this was done, and then we had this another trial called the Defined Flare trial. So Sweetheart was in Sweden from their registry. The Defined Flare was a more international. I'm forgetting how many countries. I think there were 19 countries or something. And uh, I think the main the main um, study site was some place in the UK. Um, but they again, this was funded by Philips, their volcano group. They're the ones who created this IFR uh, pressure wire. Uh, and they had patients who had stable CAD and ACS, including STEMI, 2,500 so, uh, and 1,200, 1,200 divided. And same thing with IFR, one group undergoing IFR, one group going under FFR, FFR cutoff 0.8, FFR cutoff 0.89. Um, and then the outcomes, again, uh, primary endpoint between the IFR and FFR groups, uh, no significant difference. And even if you go through each one, unplanned vascularization, non fatal MI, death from cardiovascular cause, death from uh, non cardiac causes, death from infants. No difference between the two groups. Um, so these two trials will be, and this is just, again the cap in mind. But one thing that I do want to point out to you that's just interesting if you look at this, um, uh, 
this was in New England Journal of Medicine, 2017, volume 276. Look at the page numbers, 1824 to 1834. This is the defined flare trial. If you look at the uh, IFR sweetheart trial, exactly the same, and literally just a page before. So the both of these studies were basically funded by the volcano Arnold Phillips. They um, they both were done at around the same time. They both were published in New England Journal of Medicine in the same year, in the same volume, right after, like right next to each other, one page after another. This was ended at 1823, the same, this started at 1824. So this was sort of a, a real big um, movement in interventional cardiology, the use of IFR. Uh, you know, two trials back to back, uh, literally back to back in the same volume, Penny GM, showing that IFR is equal to FFR. And you do not have to use adenosine anymore for the patients. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just a real big, uh, almost like a paradigm shift then. Um, and so uh, just summarizing the major trials, uh, the DEFER trial that was just deferring TCI for an FFR greater than 0.75. And those patients uh, did, um, uh, those patients then basically showed that you could do that uh, safely. The FAME trial was um, using FFR guided PCI versus angiographically guided PCI, showed that FFR guided PCI did better. Um, FAME 2 trial uh, was doing FFR guided PCI versus uh, uh, medical therapy for stable coronary disease, showed that FFR guided PCI was better. And then the IFR sweetheart and the defined flare trials were basically uh, showing that IFR is not inferior to um, FFR for guided PCI. Um, and so right now, currently the ACCHA guidelines for revascularization basically uh, put it as a class one indication to use um, in patients with angina, angina equivalence, undocumented ischemia, angiographic in in intermediate stenosis, um, both FFR and IFR to help decision making to proceed with PCI. And similarly, the ESC, the European guidelines, they too uh, have a class one A recommendation. Um, when uh, evidence of ischemia is not available uh, to assess the dynamic relevance of intermediate grade stenosis, both FFR or IFR. Um, and then this is just a cutoff. And this is, I think, this I think would be important from a general cardiology standpoint. So FFR 0 0.80 is a cutoff, and IFR is 0.89. And we we'll talk about slight nuances in this in a bit, but just these two values you should be knowing. Um, that's good to know. Um, and then um, coming to non hyperemic pressure. So IFR came along, but the thing about IFR was that, again, it was proprietary. It was owned by Philips, the, vol the volcano group. Um, and so nobody else could sort of make something similar. And with the IFR sweetheart and the fine flare uh, trials, it just sort of opened, a, sort of opened the floodgates for uh, avoiding the use of adenosine and using non hyperemic uh, uh, pressure uh, ratios. And so everyone sort of wanted their finger in the pie. And so you had all of these companies now scrambling to try to come up with their own way of um, doing this, but they obviously couldn't use it the exact same way because this was patented, it was proprietary. So at that point, then studies showed that, you know, the resting PDPA um, correlates extremely well with IFR and that all the other non hyperbaric pressure ratios are really indistinguishable from IFR. So all these other uh, pressure ratios, they, from what I from what I gathered was that they didn't actually compare themselves to FFR. Since IFR was thought to be equal to FFR, they made their own uh, different uh, versions of it and they compared to IFR and said that, you know, this is equal. Um, they found out that there was nothing specific about measuring the ratio during the wave period of DAS. So that the, all this, uh, you know, this hype about the wave period, it's sort of, they did studies and said, you know, it's not really that important. Um, and so you had a lot of other companies and uh, manufacturers coming up with their own pressure wires. And um, this is sort of the breakdown. I want to first focus on this part. So um, hyperemic pressure ratio, uh, we all know that's FFR. Now, non-hyperemic wire derived pressure ratios. So the IFR will be in the diast in, in diastole, uh, so wait free period and subcycle of it. So that's that's moved by Phillips, the one came on. And then you have the DFR, you have the DPR, uh, that's also in DAS. This is the whole DAS. I know about this most of because we, I know we use it here at the U, the options are. Um, and um, then we have the whole cycle. So you're looking at the whole cycle, not just DAS, that's PDP and RFR. Uh, so all of these, you do not have to give um, uh, any kind of basic dilation. So no adenosine required. 
And for all of these, I'm not sure about this one, but for this, all of these, the cutoff is 0.89. Um, and then uh, that, that's basically coronary you know, physiology, physiology testing. Uh, this is sort of the future that we're, we're trying to go towards. We talked about it very briefly, but just to let you know now, they're trying uh, try to do angiography derived FFR, so just using the angiography images. Um, and then they have these different companies that are trying to figure out how to do that, and they have their own products. Uh, I have not seen these used um, in the past by myself yet. And we all know this is a completely different topic, uh, but this is just the CT derived FFR. The first one was the FFR CT with Hartpro, and they have their own proprietary um, you know, software and stuff. And we all know that we, uh, whenever we take CT derived as a coronary CT, if we want to have the FFR, we didn't have to um, sh uh, ship off the images too hard for, for them to calculate the FFR because the algorithms are not shared and then they tell us the, the, the results. Uh, but what I really want to focus on was this area. So you can see the different uh, modalities that you know, every company is trying to come up with its own one. Um, the initial one was the one I wanted to find out was IFR. And then again, this is just a, a similar thing, just showing the cutoffs. And again, the cutoffs are all 0.89 for the non hyperemic ones. Um, I know, I know DPR, the options uh, there, we just keep the average uh, doing throughout diastole for five weeks. And I know the assist that's by Dr. Bob Wilson here, the new, um, his company um, started it. Um, and they just take the peak to peak midpoint every five weeks. So, in clinical practice, now, how do you use it? So. Uh, starting at the top, so let's say a patient comes in for unstable angina or ACS. So for the culprit lesion and FFR or IFR uh, for both, it's not really recommended. You see the culprit lesions, uh, you know, just treat it. For the non-culprit lesions though, um, you can do FFR or IFR. However, um, the current revascularization guidelines do state that um, if a patient comes in with ACS and you define the culprit vessel and you treat it, you do not have to treat the non-corporate lesions of the same sitting. Uh, you know, you should take into account the complexity of the non-corporate lesions, the uh, status of the patient, like is there cardiac shock and hypertensive and stuff, you should probably defer it um, and leave it at the discretion of the interventions. Um, so the non-corporate lesions, you don't necessarily have to do this at the same sitting, you can do this later. Now for stable angina, if you have an intermediate lesion, then obviously you should do FFR, IFR, and obviously FFR cut off 0.8, IFR 0.8, uh, 0.89. And then based on that, you decide on PCI or just doing medical therapy. And if there's a severe lesion that's greater than 90% and you see it, um, you, there's no point of doing uh, physiologic testing at that point. If it's 70 to 90%, you could do IFR, IFR, and then decide if you want to do PCI or not based on the cutoffs. Um, and then um, again, for stable coronary artery disease, for the IFR, um, the, these are subtle nuances. This part, I, I, you don't have to go into detail with, uh, but this is just to, for you to understand. So when you're in the cath lab, you can see you're going to be coming across this situation and then you understand what, what's going on in the attending mind. So um, if uh, the patient comes, basically what you have to do is you have to sort of divide the patients into high pretest probability or low pretest probability of having a uh, significant coronary artery disease causing ischemia. So let's say a patient has high pretest probability. So basically they have clinical symptoms or they have non-invasive testing consistent with ischemia. So if in that scenario, if the IFR is less than 0.89, you know that's significant, you should treat it. Now, if the IFR is 0.90 to 0.93, that's really sort of a gray zone then because you know that this patient has a high pretest probability already. So not treating a 0.90, it's just 0.01 different point and that's sort of difficult. So at that point, then you could you should consider FFR for confirmation and then seeing the FFR and then deciding if the FFR is less than 0.8, then you treat if the FFR is greater than 0.01. So it's using both. And obviously the IFR is greater than 0.93, then you treat. Um, now patients who have a low pretest probability. So these patients have clinical symptoms that are not suggestive of ischemia, or they have non-invasive testing, they're not, not consistent with ischemia, but someone was worried they ended up on the cath lab. So for them, if the IFR is greater than 0.89, you don't have to treat. Um, but again, they have a low pretest probability. So let's say it's 0 0.86 to 0.89. That's still very close to 0.89. And you really don't know if you should actually treat that or not. Uh, since you know they, they had a low pretest probability to begin with, then you can consider doing FFR and then basing it off of the FFR. And if it's less than 0.86 for those patients, you should go ahead and treat them. 
Um, and so now coming to sort of the future in this field. So uh, as I mentioned there, algorithms derive the FFR um, data from the angiographic data, uh, not using pressurized at all. And um, they can use 3D coronary tree reconstruction, constructions and reconstructions and applying flow mechanics uh, to determine resistance at the serial locations along each vessel. The uh, initial technology uh, used for the coronary tree reconstructions came from uh, CT data to determine a far that's a far CT. Um, it, uh, but the second generation is what they're trying to use using uh, just angiography images. So there's 2D angiography to come up with uh, this, uh, this data. And um, this is sort of the overlay um, so of the FFR data on the vessel. So uh, let's see. So over here, looking at this one, so over there you see a, a basically a very long, you see this in yellow line, but basically that indicates, indicates that there's a focal lesion, there's, a, there's an acute drop between the IFR over there, um, and that should be stented. Over here, you see all these small smoke, and that sort of tells you that there's a, a diffuse disease, and sort of this tells you that stenting any one of these lesions is not really going to have that great of an outcome because it's just diffuse disease. And this is somewhat more focal and diffuse disease. Um, and then the other, uh, the other way that this, this field is moving is towards coming back sort of full circle. We started with CFR that was looking at microvasculature as well. And now uh, we've done FFR, we've done IFR. We have all these different versions of IFR and non-hyperunic pressure ratios as well. Um, and now we're sort of coming back to the microvasculature. These vessels that we cannot really treat from a PCI standpoint, uh, we only have medical options for them that to not um, not really you know that great option sometimes for patients um, but uh, we're coming back to sort of testing them because uh, PET and CMR has really allowed us to see this microvascular function better uh, so there's a renewed interest in it um, and so CFR it doesn't really help so they've come up with the index of microcirculatory resistance the IMR and this just looks at the microvasculature independent of the epicardial disease. So how FFR, IFR only looks at the epicardial disease, IMR only looks at the microvasculature. And so there are commercially available pressure wires. Um, when you use like a thermal dilution technique, you measure temperature and estimate the coronary flow. Um, and then you, you see what the IMR is. Um, the only question obviously is that, you know, uh, what do you do with this? Uh, the, you can of really act upon it in the cath lab, you can try like uh, nitrates or nosine and et cetera, but there's no perfect treatment for it. So I do know that there's lots of studies being done in this field and um, even our own VA, Dr. Alok Sharma, is looking at IMR and uh, microvascular resistance. Uh, but the next step would be, uh, you know, obtaining a better understanding of this and looking for real uh, practical, good therapeutic options uh, for improving the microvascular function and outcomes for patients. Um, and with that, just going through the key takeaways. Um, so coronary intravascular imaging, it's useful for left main significance. If you have stent failure, you want to see if there's instant restenosis or stent thrombosis. Um, and then need for lesion preparation before PCI, then PCI planning as well. And then to see for your results after PCI. Uh, OCT versus IBIS. So OCT has a higher resolution, but it has less penetration, but it is better for calcium. Meanwhile, IVIS does have more penetration and it does not require blood clearing, unlike OCT. And then coronary physiologic testing, the two main things I just would like for you to remember is that the IFR cutoff is 0.89. These are non hyperemic You do not need to use vasodilation. And the FFR, you always have to use vasodilation with it. That's what it is. And that cutoff is 0.80. And these are my references. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much for your for your talk, Dr. Singh. Um, if you have questions, please do put them in the chat right now. And in the meantime, I'm going to post the link to sign up for the next um, lecture while we're waiting. I guess everybody understood everything completely 100%. So, <laughs> awesome. yeah.
but, but, but thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for your time. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye.